Hi, welcome to the channel. In this video, we want to take a look at a very well-known account where Jesus raises up a paralyzed man. Now, I think the most popular version of the story is found in Mark and Luke, where um, both Mark and Luke report the fact that there was a house where Jesus was giving some teaching and these uh, four friends of this paralyzed man carried him to the house. But in arriving there, they found that there was such a crowd around the house, they couldn't get in. So they went up on the roof. The houses in those days quite commonly had steps going up to their flat roof. So they took their friend up onto the roof, opened up the tiles and let him down in front of Jesus. So that's probably the best known version of the story. But interestingly, Matthew doesn't deal with those details. He leaves all of those details out. He doesn't speak about the house or the roof, but he says the friends brought this man to Jesus. Now, the important thing then that we need to focus on is what Matthew is wanting us to get out of this, uh, this account. Um, he's obviously wanting to pinpoint a very vital issue that could be missed if we're taken up with all the other details. So let us allow the Lord to speak to us from Matthew's account and draw um, the great truth that comes out of this. Okay, so here is the man in this picture. He's coming down through the roof. But in Matthew's version, we're not told that, as I've said. Um, <clears throat> but now let us uh, look carefully to what Matthew would like us to concentrate on because these are vital truths. Remember, we've said in previous videos that Matthew is taking us through different um, experiences and miracles that Jesus performed to enable us to understand Jesus from different points of view. So he's really introducing the Lord Jesus to us in his differing capacities so that we might see every facet of the Lord Jesus as Jesus unfolded to Matthew and to the other disciples. So let's allow uh, these wonderful truths to just somehow pour into our soul that we may get to know and love the Lord Jesus in the way that we ought to. So let's read now in the scriptures. Matthew chapter 9 and reading from verse 1. Jesus stepped into a boat. Remember he was across on the other side and there were the two demon-possessed men that he dealt with. He crossed over and came to his own town Capernaum, some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. So let's stop here for a moment and look at this. Jesus was impressed by the faith of these four men and their determination to get their sick friend in front of him. And because of that, and obviously the sick friend likewise was not objecting to coming to Jesus. He was all part of the team. So the five of them were expressing tremendous faith and determination. And their whole drive was to get in front of Jesus because they really believed that that would be the solution to this man's problem. And they obviously had compassion for their friend and they were wanting to find help for him. So then Jesus looked down at this paralyzed man and he says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, that was really an endearing term. He was saying the son there is little, little boy. Take heart, my boy, your sins are forgiven. I think if we were to translate what Jesus said into South African lingo, he would probably have said, don't stress, but. I've got this, your sins are forgiven. Don't worry, it's going to be all right. So he was calming the man down and giving him the assurance of the fact that his sins were forgiven. So this raises the question, was it because of this man's sin that he was in the condition that he was in? Um, in those days, that was the thinking, because you might remember in John chapter 9, when Jesus and the disciples came across a man that was born blind, the disciples immediately asked him, uh, Lord, is it this man's sin or his parents' sin that caused him to be born blind? And Jesus said, no, it's neither, that God may be glorified in this whole situation. 
So the thinking at that time was that the any sickness that came upon a person, it was very likely because of their sin and a judgment upon them. This may well, well have uh, come about in their thinking because of the account in the scriptures and in their history of Miriam, Moses' uh, sister, who went around bad-mouthing Moses and rejecting his authority over her. And God then struck her with a skin disease, which the Bible calls leprosy. And then when she repented, the Lord uh, healed her. So the association of um, disobedience and sin and sickness seemed to be there in the background. But of course, in the Old Testament, we also know that there's a whole book dedicated to a man who suffered intensely with boils from head to toe, and yet he was totally innocent. He had done absolutely nothing wrong. He was a righteous man, but he was an example of suffering and the Lord's deliverance. We also know if we uh, allow our minds to go to the New Testament, to James, where the scripture says, if any of us are sick, we should call for the elders, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And then it says, and if he has committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. So it's not a foregone conclusion. It, it doesn't say, and his sin shall be forgiven him, but if he has committed sin. So we're not told in this story why this man was in the condition that he was in. But Jesus obviously discerned that he was in a state uh, of guilt and of uh, fear because he felt that his sin had brought about his condition. And so the very first thing that Jesus does is he says, take heart, my boy, take heart, your sins are forgiven. Now, while this was a very kind and compassionate word from the Lord Jesus, that must have given great comfort to this man lying on his bed, it didn't go down well with some of the crowd because there were Pharisees and teachers of the law there and they were thinking some terrible thoughts in their mind, which Jesus knew he could read their thoughts. And it says, At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. So they felt that what he had said was in fact a blasphemy. And I think sometimes because we know the story so well, we tend to just gloss over these facts. But this is a very important point that Matthew is making and that we must not allow to slip through our fingers, but allow the Lord to bring this to our attention so that we may understand a deeper issue that is being dealt with here. Allow me to unpack this a little so that we can dig down to the depths of this profound truth. So let me present this example to you. If, if you were a Roman Catholic and you had sinned, what would you do? Apparently, you would have to go to confession. So there's a confession box and you go into the one side and close the door. The priest goes into the other side and then slides a little window open. I only know this from watching movies. Um, <clears throat> and then you would uh, say to the priest, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And then the priest would say, well, my child, what have you done? And then you would uh, pour out your guts and he would listen to your whole sad story. And then perhaps he would present you with a few things to do. He might say something like, well, to prove your uh, sincerity of your repentance, give up coffee for the next week. Um, and then to prove your um, devotion to the Lord, say 10 Hail Marys every day for the next week. And then to just prove that you are absolutely sincere and you're willing to make sacrifice, put $100 in the church's collection. And, and that might be his advice. But then you walk out of that uh, confession box and you feel a weight of your shoulders because you have somehow spoken it out and you, you feel a lot better um, as a Roman Catholic. But the question is, are you really forgiven? Um, and that's the big issue that Matthew is focusing our attention upon. So let's take the same scenario and put it into a more familiar Protestant setting. Uh, let's say that there's something that is really upon your conscience and you're wanting to find relief and uh, forgiveness and be freed from it. You would go to the leaders of your church, it might be a pastor or your elders, and you would speak to them and unfold 
the facts that are, are concerning you and worrying you. Now, if the elders then give you some advice, uh, pray for you and uh, uh, encourage you to turn away from that thing, repent and give you some advice as to how you should continue to conduct yourself in a, in a pure and righteous way without falling into sin. Uh, and they've given you this advice. In the same way, you could walk away feeling that you've unburdened your heart. But the question is, are you really forgiven? That's really, as I said, what Matthew is wanting us to see very clearly. That in actual fact, there is only one human being in the universe that can possibly forgive sins, and that is the Lord Jesus. So let's now ask the question, why did those Pharisees and teachers of the law have such a problem with Jesus forgiving the man's sin? Uh, let's try and get into their thinking about this to understand where they were coming from, because they had a very, very serious accusation against Jesus. <clears throat> their problem was that the Torah was very specific about how to deal with sin in that day. It was a very public thing. People had to go to the temple. So I've got a picture now of the model of the temple in Jesus' day. That's, how, that's what the temple looked like. So if anyone sinned and they wanted to free their conscience and find forgiveness, they would have to travel from wherever they were to this temple in Jerusalem, go through that front gate, go to the left to that um, building there with the, the red roof. That was Solomon's porch or the portico. And if they'd not brought a lamb with them, they could buy a lamb from that area. Uh, and then they would have to come across to the central place and line up because there would be a whole long row of people with lambs waiting to confess their sins and find forgiveness. And you can well imagine standing in that row, um, people saying, well, what are you here for? What have you done? and uh, looking and eyeing one another. Uh, and, and the whole process was a very difficult one and a very public one. And so they would eventually arrive at that gate into the courtyard of the temple. And there the priest would be waiting for them. They'd put their hands upon the little lamb and uh, in a way pass their sin onto that lamb and watch the lamb being slaughtered right before them, the shedding of blood. And uh, that's how their sins then were dealt with in the Old Testament context. Let me just give you a closer picture. That's the temple. That's the gate right there in front. You go through with your lamb for the priest to sacrifice. That was the temple in the time of the Lord Jesus. So what the Pharisees and the lawgivers were having a great problem with was that Jesus was replacing the lamb and he was replacing the most holy building in all of Israel, the temple. He had now become the temple in putting himself in the position to forgive sins. And if you blaspheme the temple, according to their law, the Sanhedrin could actually stone you to death. That's what happened with Stephen. So this was a very, very serious thing in their eyes. But wisely and wonderfully, Jesus addressed this whole situation. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, Get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus said, I have authority to forgive sins, and he is the only one. He often referred to himself as the Son of Man because he wanted us to understand that as a human being, being given authority to forgive the sins of men and women on earth. Now, allow me to tell you another little parable. If I was a witness on the side of a road uh, to an accident, where someone was stopped at a traffic light and someone else came driving along, didn't see that the car was stopped, screeched on their brakes and slammed into the back of the car in front of him. Um, and the two drivers get out in the, in the road and they begin to have a big argument. 
I then go over as the witness and I address them both and say, just calm down, gentlemen. I was a witness to this whole thing and I'm saying to the man who drove the car behind, I'm saying to you, you are forgiven. You can now go. You can just imagine how furious the man in, in the front would be because his car's damaged. He'd say, what right have you got to forgive this man? You haven't uh, suffered any injury. My car is damaged. I need it repaired. How dare you say uh, this man can just go and that he's forgiven? So the point that, we're ma that I'm making here is that we've got to try and understand how Jesus had the authority to forgive. So let's look at it like this. <clears throat> the driver in front who had suffered the damage is really the only one in the position to offer forgiveness. Now, this particular driver wasn't willing to do that, but he was in the position to offer forgiveness. So let's understand this point. The, the offended party is in the position, and only the offended party is in the position to offer forgiveness. Very important point. So was Jesus in the position to offer this man forgiveness? And the truth is, absolutely he was. Let's consider how we understand that. The scripture is very clear that God made human beings in his image and likeness. And his intention was that everything we do and everything that we say would be a reflection of God. So anything we do and say that does not reflect God um, is an affront to him and is, in fact, damaging God's reputation on earth. Because remember the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if we're not doing the Father's will on earth as it is in heaven, then we are damaging the reputation of God. So primarily, whatever sin we commit we are offending God. God is the offended party. And Jesus, as God, is the one who is able to offer forgiveness. He is also in a position to judge us, if necessary. But instead of judging us, he is offering forgiveness. What a wonderful thing. So as the injured party, he is saying, I am forgiving you. But let me change my accident account just a little to illustrate this point. If I, as the witness, said to the two arguing drivers, listen, this man who crashed into you, I'm saying to him, he is forgiven. But I'll tell you what, I will cover the damages. I will pay for your damages, but let this man go. In that case, he would say, my, I don't know where you come from or why you're doing this, but fine, let him go as long as you pay for my damages. Now, in the same way, Jesus is authorized to forgive sins because he was prepared to take the damages. He was prepared to take upon himself everything that every man and every woman has committed and pay the full price, take the full punishment for our sin. So whatever we've done, Jesus, in a certain sense, is stepping into that and saying, no, I have done it. Although he didn't do it, he was innocent, but he was saying, I have done it, I will take the punishment. And this man, this woman can go free. So the Lord Jesus is in the prime position and he's the only one in the universe that is in this position to forgive our sins. So let's get back to these four wonderful friends that were so concerned about their paralyzed friend that they made the effort to get him to Jesus. And it took a lot of effort, as we know. Their problem and their challenge was a geographic one and then a physical one, how to get this man in front of Jesus. But let us consider the principle that is being established here. Jesus has returned to heaven in our situation and so is no longer physically available. So we can't, if we have a, a friend or a person with a problem, we can't physically take them to Jesus. But what we can do is spiritually bring them before the Lord. So let's consider how this can be done. There are many lovely believers who are paralyzed 
by many different things. Paralyzed by guilt, paralyzed by fear, paralyzed by lack of faith, paralyzed by being disillusioned, uh, paralyzed by being hurt by someone in the fellowship. Uh, and the list goes on. So there are many that are paralyzed. Um, and the Lord has placed brothers and sisters in the church, and he's also placed ministries in the church. So there are those who can help, and we need to help those that are paralyzed. Like those four friends, we need to make every effort to get that paralyzed person to Jesus. So here is what we should consider very carefully. If a spiritually paralyzed person were to come to, let's say, the elders or the pastor or the leaders, or even to a, a brother in, or brethren in the fellowship um, with a problem, and, and they're asking for advice and counsel, the temptation is always there to offer advice and counsel, take them to the scriptures, um, ask them what their problem is, try to get to the bottom of their problem, and deal with their situation, and then pray for them and send them on their way. The problem with that approach is that their, their paralysis never goes away. And you end up carrying a paralyzed person around on their mat or their mattress uh, forever. This is the experience of so many. And there's so many in the church that, see, that seem to need to be carried constantly. But if we can learn this great lesson that Matthew is teaching us, that whatever ministry one might have, we need to find the skill and the wisdom not to offer counsel and direction, but to find a way to bring that person into the presence of Jesus. Because until we can make the connection between the Lord Jesus Christ and that paralyzed person, they will never be healed. They'll never be set free. So the primary thrust of any ministry that the Lord has given to us is to get an injured person in front of Jesus so that he might minister to them one-on-one -on -one and get them healed and delivered and set free. I say this because while a lot of wise counsel can be given, the person that you have counseled uh, will be looking to you constantly. So they've got you on speed dial. And whenever there's a problem, they're phoning you. While that is a good thing to have, um, have this support, which is wonderful, you will end up carrying that person until they are brought face to face with the Lord Jesus. He alone can forgive sins. He alone can set free. And he is the healer. So he's the head of the church. And we need to... Now, whatever ministry we have, whatever input we might have, our whole thrust and purpose and drive and goal is to get every single brother and sister at the feet of Jesus in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him so that they might find a solution to their problem. It's, it's always comforting when our brothers and sisters say, look, we, we know what you're going through. We are bearing you up in prayer. Uh, we're with you in this. And, and that's comforting and that's good. But until that person is brought face to face with the Lord Jesus, and really I believe that's what Matthew is focusing on here in this wonderful account, that Jesus is the one with authority to forgive sins, but also authority to say, take up your bed and walk. The response of the crowd is significant. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to human beings. It seems at this time in which we're living that the Lord is cleaning up his house and calling true believers to check their hearts, check their relationship with the Lord, and to come forward and to repent, but to come and meet up with the Lord Jesus on a one-to-one -one basis and find his forgiveness and find that relationship restored. Don't allow anything to come in the way between you and the Lord Jesus. It's the greatest privilege that he's offering to us to turn to him 
even in the last letter that he wrote in the book of Revelation to the church of Laodicea, he is saying, come and buy of me, I solve, that you may see, and gold tried in the fire, repent and turn. In each of the letters, in fact, he is saying, repent and come back to me. And perhaps that's the message of the hour for each one of us individually to come before the Lord Jesus, the only human being who has been authorized to deal with our situation, to forgive us, to set us free and to heal us of our spiritual paralysis that we can rise up, take up our bed and walk and follow him and do the will of our father before Jesus comes again in power and great glory to set up his kingdom on earth. God bless you. Amen.